Dr. Shannon Bales was originally born in Delaware. She then attended college at the University of Notre Dame, where she was a dual major in English and pre-medical studies, graduating magna cum laude. She then attended Tulane University School of Medicine, where she received several awards, including being elected to the Gold Humanism Honor Society, the Glasgow Rubin Citation for Academic Achievement from the American Medical Women's Association, the Department of Medicine Chairman's Award, and was inducted into the Alpha Omega Alpha Honor Society for Academic Achievement. She then completed her internal medicine internship and residency, as well as her endocrinology fellowship at the University of Los Angeles, California. During residency, she received a citation for excellence in medical student teaching and also received various research grants. Dr. Bales moved to the Tri-Cities in Washington with her family in 2012. She was particularly interested in the care of diabetes, thyroid conditions, osteoporosis, and polycystic ovary syndrome. She is a current member of the American Diabetes Association, the Endocrine Society, and the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists. She is board certified in both internal medicine and endocrinology. Her practice philosophy involves individualizing care and thus stressed the primary role of a physician as a compassionate listener. Please welcome Dr. Shannon Bale. Well, hello, everyone. Um, can you hear me? It sounds like it's on. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. I was absolutely honored when Lee asked me to participate, um, and I am humbled by the depth and breadth of experience and knowledge in this audience. Um, I'm also incredibly psyched at how many people mentioned endocrinology in their talks ahead of time. I could spend hours talking about those circadian rhythms, talking about bariatric surgery, talking about diabetes and pregnancy, um, and all kinds of other things, but today we're here to focus mostly on diabetes, um, obesity, and how it connects with oral health, and in particular dentistry. Now, I'll be 100% honest, um, my experience and knowledge of dentistry is a m small fraction of most people here. So if I have any mistakes, if there are any problems, any concerns, feel free to raise your hand and correct me. Um, but I know that we're kind of running towards the end of the day. I'm gonna keep it a little on the light side. I'm happy for this to be informal. Shout questions out if you have any, anything that you wanna mention. So. Um, I don't have any disclosures. Um, I love taking care of diabetes. Um, I take care of lots of other things too, but, but I love taking care of diabetes. Um, as you heard, my medical training was primarily um, in New Orleans and in Los Angeles. Um, and I'm happy to have ended up here actually almost two years ago now. Um, so this is my quick outline. I believe you might even have my slides somewhere, some of you in front of you. Um, and essentially, I'm going to just go, go over briefly what is diabetes definitions, um, why do we care about it so much, the fact that it's actually getting worse. This is an epidemic in this country now. And then what can we do about it? Um, general treatment principles and how dental care can really make a big difference and an impact on this medical condition and in the lives of people with diabetes. So as we actually just heard uh, from our previous speaker, um, 25 million Americans have diabetes. There's another amazing amount that have pre-diabetes and another amazing amount that don't actually know that they have diabetes and, it's, and the numbers are rising by the day, by the minute. Um, so it's very common, everybody knows someone who has diabetes. Um, and this is sort of a, a definition of diabetes. It refers to a group of diseases that affect how the body uses blood glucose. Technically, these are the diagnostic criteria. Um, fasting plasma glucose of 126, two hours after one of those glucose tests where you drink that really, really sweet juice, and um, if your blood sugar goes over 200, that's considered diabetes. If you ever have a blood sugar over 200, that's diabetes. And we also, um, in the past five to 10 years, have um, started allowing use of an A1C to diagnose diabetes. That's a lot easier than an oral glucose tolerance test. We can do these in our office while you sit there, get an A1C. If it's above 6.5, you have diabetes. Um, I want to point out that I think that this definition of diabetes isn't 
quite right. It really is a diverse group of conditions. I often um, feel that diabetes maybe should have a different name in each person who has it because we're, there's so many factors that go into um, treatment of this condition and why someone might have it that um, we really have to be very meticulous about individualizing care in diabetes. So when I say a diverse group of diseases, well, we have all kinds of names for it. Has anyone ever noticed that? Type 1, type 2, gestational, insulin dependent, diet and exercise control, metabolic syndrome, prediabetes and parafasting glucose. These that I have mentioned don't even include some of the more rare causes of diabetes like mitochondrial diabetes and other, other things. So there's all kinds of names for it. The bottom line is the blood sugar is high. Um, that is the definition, but when we look at what is diabetes truly, uh, I had a professor who once told me, you know, if we had been able to easily track fatty acids with a finger stick at home, we would be tracking fatty acids instead of blood sugars when we're talking about diabetes, okay? so. Um, so part of the reason that we have so many names for diabetes, part of the reason that we have so many treatments for it is that it, honest to goodness, is different in everyone. Um, and these are some things that we often talk about. You know, is it, um, is it the fatty acids? Is it the high sugars? Is it a glucagon response that's, you know, overstimulated? Um, what causes the complications? Is it the buildup of sugar residues on all of your body tissues? Um, is it that you have too little insulin or do you just, are you just resistant to that insulin? It's, it's, a, it's a very complicated picture. Um, but one thing that I really do want to stress here, which I think is a point that has been made um, along the line today in various, instance, various conditions is that um, it's really the end of the line when we start seeing the blood sugars go up. Your body has done everything it can do in its power to maintain that homeostasis for probably years before we start seeing high blood sugars. So in a sense, you know, we talk about kidney disease, stage one, stage, stage two, you know, end stage, you know, when your blood sugars start going up, we're actually sort of at the end of the line of what your body can do on its own. So I, I just want to stress that, yes, we're talking about diabetes, but the, but in the next 10 to 15 years, we're going to be hearing so much about um, earlier stages of diabetes, tracking earlier markers, because when we get to high blood sugars, we've already got a major problem, even pre-diabetes, which makes it sound like it's not really a major deal. It already is a problem to have pre-diabetes. Um, and so, so why do we care about diabetes? Okay, I, I, I realize that everybody's sitting here and saying, yeah, I know what diabetes is, I know it causes complications, you've just heard all of these, all of these other wonderful presenters talk about coronary artery disease, but um, we're really talking about complications and actually cost, okay? We're gonna go over some numbers a little bit here, but it won't surprise you to learn that um, care of diabetes and diabetes-related conditions are one of the number one or you know, one of the highest reasons why we actually um, use medical dollars in this country. Um, Dr. Wine just talked about the microvascular complications from diabetes. They tend to travel together, neuropathy, nephropathy, retinopathy, um, gastroparesis, um, erectile dysfunction. A lot of these things are from microvascular complications. Then we've got these macrovascular complications, coronary artery disease, strokes. Really, it's all funneling down into a common pathway that we heard a lot about already today. Um, a lot of my slides have, are coming from the International Diabetes Foundation, the American Diabetes Association, the CDC. That's because, you know, you can find something similar to this, a slide like this. You just Google and there it is. But, um, but this just gives you an idea of this is, a, this is a condition that affects the entire body. Head to toe, start to finish, front to back, inside and out, diabetes affects every part of the body. Um, and I think you saw something like this earlier today when we're talking about macrovascular disease. We've got heart attacks in people with, that, with and without diabetes. I put that little square around that because I always remember and I tell my patients, if you have diabetes, your risk of having a heart attack is the same as somebody who has already had a heart attack. So we've got to remember some of these things. Diabetes is the leading cause, aside from trauma, of blindness, amputations, kidney failure, you name it, it is the leading cause of major complications in this country. 
Um, and overall, the risk of death for people with uncontrolled diabetes is about twice that of uh, anyone at any given age. So again, the cost. You know, cost is always a bit of a difficult uh, thing to talk about. We've got, are we talking about outpatient care? Are we talking about cost from complications? Are we talking about um, hospital stays? But the bottom line is that um, the annual health care cost for adults is $153 billion across the country, and it's just going up from there. Um, and the estimated expenditures potentially by 2025 might be something like $400 billion around the country around the world. Um, so um, this is a, sort of a, a phrase that I hear a lot actually in the diabetes um, and the diabetes conferences. It's, got, it's just going up and you know among diabetologists there is this strange um, almost validation every time something comes out that's like now this many people have diabetes you know everybody gets a little excited but Clearly, of course, we're not going to be excited about this. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about obesity. Dr. Wine talked about it as well. I'm going to kind of fly through some of these things. But I, I want to pause here to make a really important point that um, I hope you sort of remember as we, we walk away from this. Um, obesity and type 2 diabetes in particular are clearly connected. But I also want you to know that that is not the end of the story. Okay, um, there are morbidly obese people that have no problem with their blood sugars. Diabetes is a genetic condition. It's a predisposition for the beta cells of the pancreas to not be able to put out as much insulin as the body needs. Now, um, the way that the endocrine system works in other organs, the, the endocrine organ just gets bigger if its job gets harder. It just gets bigger and makes more of the hormone. And that's what's supposed to happen to the pancreatic beta cell. But if it can't just keep getting bigger and stronger and putting out more insulin, then there's a problem. And that is usually a genetic condition. Okay? So even though we're talking about obesity, you know, I, there's a lot of um, stigma attached with having diabetes, but it is a genetic condition. And, and, um, and so it's nothing that I want. I, I try and tell all of my patients, this is, this is a genetic condition, and I want you to you know, be aware of that, and that's what we're treating. So, but in all honesty, their obesity is associated with all kinds of metabolic problems. And whether or not you can go run a marathon, but you're still 50 pounds overweight, whether or not that's healthy, I, you know, it's being debated. Uh, there are a lot of people who think that obesity in any form is, is really going to be a major problem. And we're still sort of working that out. Um, so I'm going to fly through these. I wouldn't be shocked if some of you have seen this before. Um, this is going to take us from uh, about, about 20 years here. Um, and it's going to show us the correlation between obesity and diabetes. It's going to move forward. And you're going to see that the countries just get, the con our country just gets redder and redder and redder. And it's moving. And it's taken over the country. Um, this is the closest thing I have to a time-lapse video, um, but what you can see here is that um, we're just, this is the, the incidence of obesity and diabetes have coincided. So here, is, this is just showing again uh, the relationship between diabetes and obesity. And as I mentioned, there's clearly a connection. We don't know what it is. Um, you know, I, I want to take one minute to pause here as well. This connection between obesity and diabetes and why both have increased so much in the past 20 years um, is really a fascinating story. Um, and we're going to be hearing more about it as time goes on. Um, the keynote speaker at the ADA last year um, thinks that it really has to do with food additives, essentially non-food additives. She showed a she showed a picture of the ingredients from some ice cream. And there were maybe 40 things listed on the ingredients, and maybe only three that you would identify as actual food. And so there's, there's, um, there's a lot of theories that people are working on about why obesity and diabetes have increased so much over the past 20 years. Prevalence going up. Not a surprise to anyone. Is it happening only in the United States? Absolutely not. I'm not quite sure why Canada is going to be so hard hit in the next couple of years, but um, the prevalence is going up everywhere. Is it happening only to adults? No. 
kids are becoming more obese. It used to be that when a child came in and had diabetes, it was automatically considered type 1, which is the autoimmune destruction of the pancreatic beta cells. Um, there are whole conferences dedicated to how do you tell whether a child has type 2 or type 1 now? Um, how do we treat it? Well, lifestyle modifications, biggest one. Okay? I, um, everybody talks about this. Everybody knows what we can and should do. It's a lot easier to talk about than to put into practice. But lifestyle modifications are very important. Diabetes educators can really help out with that as well. Then we move on to medications. Okay? This is not for anyone to remember. This is the kind of stuff that I get in terms of guidelines from my societies. We've got more medications that we can use um, than, you can, than you might be able to see here, but they all have their own risks. Um, most importantly, most of them cause weight gain, <laughs> which is a problem, as you guys all are aware of. Um, then we also have these algorithms for what if the first thing or second thing or third thing you try doesn't work or they're allergic to it. What do you do? Well, anyway, this is not for you guys to manage, but this is just to give you an idea of all the tools that we do have at our disposal to try to control diabetes. Then we've got the comorbid conditions that we want to try and help address. Hypertension, hyperlipidemia, obesity, renal disease, cardiovascular disease, and this is where we get our other subspecialists involved. Yet again, driving up the cost of taking care of someone that has diabetes. Um, we've also got screening tests we recommend for everyone. Go to the eye doctor, go to the foot doctor, get a stress test. And these are all considered um, important parts of diabetes care. It essentially comes down to what are these modifiable risk factors. This we've heard uh, um, regarding numerous things, regarding periodontal disease and diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Um, we've heard that over and over today. And these red ones here are um, kind of considered modifiable risk factors. Can't change your age or gender, but you might be able to affect some of these other things. What should be here? Periodontal disease. What else should be here? We just heard from Dr. Wind. Sleep apnea. Okay? All these things should really be there. So what can we do about treating diabetes? We can get a dental exam. I tell my patients, over and over and over. I want you to test your blood sugars. I want you to eat right. I want you to exercise. I want you to come back every three months. I want you to get blood work as often as you know I say and your other doctor says. And, and then you got to go to a diabetes educator and get your eyes checked. And I say, but you know what? Of all the things that I'm asking you to do today, the easiest for you to do is go get your teeth checked. Go get your gums checked. That is the easiest thing that you can do that I am asking you for today. And I actually tell them that way. Um, so here's the, I, here's the general idea. People with diabetes are more likely to get periodontal disease, especially if their diabetes is poorly controlled. Periodontal disease is going to make their diabetes harder to control. And people with diabetes and periodontal disease are more likely to have cardiovascular events. Now. Um, Again, it's sort of in the interest of time, but also because you've heard this from much more articulate speakers today than myself. Um, there are all kinds of studies that are coming out much um, every day, new information. The link is becoming more clear. And so um, here, this is an example of your diabetes is going to be harder to control if you have if you have periodontal disease and you're more likely to have severe periodontal disease if your blood sugars are uncontrolled. This is um, showing us very similar things about complications from diabetes and, um, and the interaction. There's clearly a link. And what I'd like to do is kind of run past these because you guys have heard all this in terms of mortality and atherosclerosis and all kinds of other things today. But here's the key. It goes both directions. Guess what? You can actually prevent someone from developing diabetes by taking care of their teeth. And we can help their diabetes be better controlled by taking care of their periodontal disease. If they take care of their diabetes, they're also less likely to get periodontal disease. It works both directions. Okay? This is a fascinating study. Um, they, uh, what they actually did here is they actually um, took people with normal blood sugars, looked at their teeth, and then 10 years later, Look to see who developed blood sugar problems. And actually, people who had deep pockets with normal blood sugars at the time were more likely to develop diabetes in 10 years. 
What's the link? Infection, inflammation, you guys have heard all of this. Um, now, these are some pictures that um, Dr. Osler actually provided to me that I was astounded by. And he's done all of the, the mathematics behind this, but we, this is sort of a model of periodontal disease, gum inflammation. Um, if you try to calculate the surface area of infection in periodontal disease, how big is that wound? It actually works out to be maybe the size of the palm of your hand. If this was an ulcer on someone's foot, we would be talking amputation. Can't really do that with the mouth. So, periodontal treatment is the closest thing that we can get to wound care for diabetes. Um, and again, if you have questions about how this was done, Dr. Osler was the one who put this together, but I was astounded when I saw this. So we're back to why do we care? If, you, if your patients don't care about treating their periodontitis or their diabetes because it will help them live longer, healthier, happier lives, sometimes talking to them about the cost can motivate them. Um, in 2012, there was a fairly recent study that came out of um, University of Pennsylvania, and $1,500 per year for patients who actually have periodontal disease that gets treated. So they're saving maybe up to $1,500 per year if they actually just go get their teeth cleaned. Um, but guess what, guys? We need everybody's help in this room because I, all, I only see people after they've already been diagnosed with diabetes. They come to me saying, I have diabetes. What do I do about it? But we need your help to help people know themselves that they have diabetes. If they don't go to their doctor, or if their doctor doesn't check, um, there are ways that as hygienists and dentists and periodontists that you can know if somebody has diabetes, probably even without any blood work. So let's just talk about that for a second. Um, first of all, people with diabetes don't even know about periodontal disease being an issue for them. They know that, yeah, okay, it'll affect my feet. Yeah, okay, it'll affect my vision. Yeah, okay, it'll affect my kidneys. I know, I know. My doctor told me I was going to get kidney disease when I first got diagnosed with this. But only a third of them know about the periodontal disease. And guess what? The people who know are told by their dentists. They're not even told by their endocrinologists or their, their primary care physicians or whoever else is taking care of them. They're told by their dentists. So, um, so there's a, there's, a, there's a piece of information missing here in the general population that we all have to do a better job getting the word out. Um, now, um, how do we recognize diabetes and prediabetes? The, the idea is, is that if you see um, a quarter or so of the pockets is being deep, or four missing teeth, you have a really high chance of having diabetes. So if you just sort of keep that in mind, and as you're talking to your patients, a casual, hey, has anyone ever asked you if you have diabetes, or have you ever asked your doctor if you have diabetes, will really, really set them on the right path. You pretty much know that they have a problem with their blood sugars if you have a quarter of the pockets being deep and or four or more missing teeth. A um, couple of other things, tooth decay, um, oral infections, change in taste, um, uh, other, other kind of ulcerative things. Uh, it's, it's amazing the dental problems that are associated with diabetes. Um, so this, this is just putting, it a, putting some of the stuff that we already talked about a different way. You know, diabetes absolutely, it's kind of a, another summary slide. Diabetes is a risk factor for gum disease. And poor blood sugar control leads to gum disease. Um, but then we have a then when it goes both ways, you take care of the diabetes, you're not as likely to get periodontal disease. You take care of the periodontal disease, you're likely to either get rid of diabetes or never get it, or at least improve treatment. So watching this is really an essential part of diabetes care. Um, there are a couple of other things that I just want to mention, okay? Um, when we're talking about dental care and diabetes, and we've heard a lot about this already um, from, um, from uh, Dr. Neighbor before, um, 
Di patients with diabetes are at high risk for not healing wounds, whether that's in the mouth um, or on the foot. Um, and so um, things like antibiotics and, and maybe more frequent return visits to check on how things are going after dental surgery or periodontal disease is really, really should be something that you consider doing in any patient that has diabetes. Um, I don't know how many people here actually talk with their patients about how much diabetes medication they're on and what they should do with their diabetes medication um, kind of around the time of surgery or around the time of cleanings. Um, the bottom line is that if someone's, someone's blood sugars are hard to control or if they are on insulin, you may want to ask them to talk with the prescribing physician about what they should do with their diabetes medications even just before a simple cleaning, definitely before oral surgery. Um, and the answer is not going to be the same for everyone. You know, something that I sort of standardly tell people is, okay, take 50% of your basal insulin the night before and the morning of. You'll probably be somewhere okay if you do it that way. But that's not necessarily true for everyone. So I can't stand up here and give you a recommendation again because diabetes is such an individual condition that... Um, they really should speak with their prescribing physician if they are on insulin to get recommendations about what to do before any kind of surgery. Um, the other thing too is, in your offices, do you guys keep glucometers? Or do you keep juice for people who might be having a low blood sugar? Or any of these, that's great. If you don't just get some of that stuff, those glucose tabs will last you for 10 years, you know, but at least you have something to give someone if they're having a low blood sugar. Um, you know, if we make them, um, if we ask them not to, to eat anything before surgery or before cleaning for whatever reason, um, there's a very good chance that people will have a low blood sugar in your office. And that can be, well, it can be life-threatening, to be perfectly honest. So um, having something there that you can check the blood sugar and give them, like in the way of juice, is a great thing. Um, someone's going low is a really important safety feature for um, any office that ever has patients with diabetes come through. Um, does anybody know anything about insulin pumps? Okay, this is, this is kind of great, great. I love the hands up in the air. Um, insulin pumps are, um, they're not magic, but they keep insulin in them. And if you have somebody who's having a really severe low blood sugar that has an insulin pump, just take it off and you'll do a lot for them. So, um, so I just want to kind of, for, for the short time, while they're having a low blood sugar, you can just go ahead and take it off. Okay. Um, the main point here is that we're all going to be working together. And if you have questions about someone's management or um, what other kind of complications they have from their diabetes, or if you find people who you highly suspect have diabetes, please have them talk to their primary care doctor. You can send them my direction. Um, there are other endocrinologists in the community who I'm sure would be more than happy to, to help. And um, so I tried to go through all that fairly rapidly. I know it's Friday and everybody wants to get out of here. Um, but if there are any questions, I'm happy to entertain them at this time. Um, yes? Oh, okay. What a wonderful resource, thank you. Just in, just in case everybody couldn't hear that, um, the Dental Hygiene School at Columbia Basin College um, is, a, is an excellent resource for people who say that financially they're not going to be able to see a dentist. That's wonderful, thank you. Any other questions, comments? Okay, well thanks folks. <laughs>